around the microphone so that it can be picked up by the uh, uh, camera. Good to see you guys. Um, I just have a, I don't know if it's a question or a thought, but um, and not everybody in the room may agree with this, but I think unfortunately our political system has been terribly corrupted by the influence of money. And we ask, what can we do in our political system? We have to support causes that support our beliefs. Financially, to the tunes of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. Because we are being outspent by evil one, big time, in every arena. Any comments? Yes? Okay. I, I guess the only thing you have to turn your microphone on. Yeah, you have to have a microphone. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I think the only thing that I would um, I would say is, is that, you know, I think it's a lot easier to do that by cause than it is by party or candidate, unless you can find somebody you can really get behind 100%. I mean, one of the reasons I'm a political independent is I've been kicked out of every decent party that, you know. No, the, it, it's really hard to find any group that you're going to line up. There is no Catholic party. Um, so you have to do the best you can in support of what you can. Okay. It, it just kind of as a further comment, Dave, I mean, I, I think that's really true, but I think one of the things we always have to be careful of is that money, and, and there's not much you can do, but money corrupts. Uh, and the more money corrupts even more, and we know that. And so when there's a lack of transparency, we know that money creates opportunities for the use of power, and the power can be used for good or evil. But just as we need to get behind those causes, we need to make sure that as we get behind those causes, that, that there's a level of transparency that ensures that, that what is going on and how the money is being used and being done in a way that is consistent with what we expect and what we hope. Thanks, Ken. I think we also need to, um, you know, we need to know what the candidates stand for. You know, what comes around to elections. You know, how, how, how are they in line with Catholic teaching? You know, it doesn't matter what party they're from. That does, that's immaterial from a Catholic perspective. You know, it's, it's how, do, how, do their, how, how do their values, how do what they're putting out there line up with Catholic social teaching? And then we vote according to that, not according to parties. Yes. If you take religion out of the question, is there any difference from denying service to someone who has same-sex attraction and denying someone because of their race? Yeah, from from a legal standpoint. Um, just leave it on, Jim. Is it on now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, from a legal standpoint, it depends on where you are. Uh, race is what they call a suspect classification, meaning that it is per se considered an improper basis for any to distinguish anything. In some states, sexual orientation has been added to the list of suspect classifications. Now, let's take the most obvious, the, the most common use of that distinction is in the marriage uh, standpoint. A lot of times, bans on same-sex marriage or, or laws that define marriage as between one man and one woman have been um, compared to the laws of the early 20th century that prohibited interracial marriage. And on that, I would say, again, setting religion aside, the biology is completely different. Um, their interracial marriages are biologically equivalent to same-race marriages. Uh, Same-sex marriages are not biologically equivalent to um, one man and one woman marriages, and when you find those kinds of distinctions, it creates a logical basis of legal distinction. So setting religion aside, that's the way that we're going. Yes. 
You know, uh, I think going along with that, and maybe not from the legal standpoint, but when you get in conversations with people, as the bishop talked about uh, defending our, our Catholic beliefs, and you talk about same-sex marriage, and it comes up the question as well, isn't that, aren't you really discriminating against these people? Aren't you supposed to love everyone? And, you know, it, it, you start getting into conversations, and, and yeah, I'll admit it, I mean, at, at some point it's, you know, how, how do you keep defending yourself? Because there's a lot of people against us, unfortunately, so. I think there is a lot of people against us, but you know, again, it's how we frame what, what we believe. You know, we're called to love. We can love them. We just don't have to agree with, uh, because their way of living is completely contrary to our Catholic beliefs. And, you know, in the end, you probably will end up agreeing to disagree, but if we don't enter into the dialogue, then they never know what we really believe. And I think that's what's important. Um, I mean, I, I don't think, I, I don't know that I would have very little power to change somebody who's, who totally believes it's, that same-sex marriage is just is, is great and very appropriate. You know, if they're entrenched in that mindset, you know, only the Lord can change their heart. But having said that, if I don't engage them in a conversation and share with them what we believe and why we believe it and how beautiful it is and what it provides, not just for it, what it provides for the individual, for the couple, for the family, for society, um, and put it, put all of that out there, then they, then they won't know. Then we'll, they'll always believe, well, we just hate people of same sex, people in same sex marriages. We don't hate them at all. We have a better way. In a more beautiful way because it's from God and we need to share that. Just kind of, kind of a final commentary on that. Yeah, I think that, you know, there's, there's a, as we look at this, no one at this point is telling the Catholic Church that, that, that uh, our view of, of marriage is under direct attack at this point. In other words, we're not being told that the Catholic Church is going to be uh, required to grant sacramental marital recognition to same sex couples. And so, but what we're really talking about is what about the, the notion of that, of what role that plays in the, in the entire marketplace of, of these political and social issues and ideas. And I think one of the real, and I think Jeff touched on this, one of the real challenging things, and maybe Dave kind of brought up is, it's very difficult when someone gets to define the issue the way that it's often defined when this subject comes up regarding same-sex marriage, you almost feel like you're a horrible person because you don't, you aren't willing to respect them or you aren't willing to respect the relationship that they have and that sort of thing in, in, in society as a whole. But I think it, what, what we need to recognize and what we hope people will recognize is that there's a unique distinction in the role that, 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 that a marriage between a man and a woman in society plays. Now I'm talking about both legally and culturally and the role that is played in, in a same-sex relationship that the unique responsibility that a husband and wife and the bearing and begetting of children have for the ongoing continuation of society and has for thousands of years is simply a different and unique relationship. And, and there's, it will, that will never change. And the relationship, the, the issue of a same-sex union will never occupy that. So the real question that we face in society is, are we going to recognize what we've recognized for thousands of years? And that's the unique role and relationship that a marriage between a man and a woman plays in society, and is it going to be treated the same way as other kinds of relationships? And then we also begin the slippery slope, I think, of asking ourselves, if that relationship is only going to be defined based on how I feel about another person, well, what if I feel that way about three or four different people? I mean, at a certain point in time, if the way we define something that's been defined a certain way for thousands of years is now only going to be defined by my, the way that I feel about someone, then if I can feel that way about a half a dozen people, then pretty soon we've simply defined marriage completely out of our culture. It has no meaningful role to play because now it's just a contractual relationship between and among as many people as may want to do it. So I think that's the real challenge, is getting people to understand that there is, in fact, a unique role that's played, and has been for thousands of years, between the relationship between a man and a woman and that marriage in society. Not to say, and I think the church and the bishops have spoken very clearly on this, not to say that we have a right to discriminate in society between 
people of, who have a same-sex attraction to one another in terms of their civil rights. But what we're saying is there is a unique role that is played in the relationship between a man and a woman. Thanks, Tim. I also think it's important to say I can love you and not agree with you, and I can. And when people come up and say, you know, you don't love, we don't love people with same-sex attraction because we don't want them to get married. I think that's a ludicrous argument. I mean, you guys are sitting up there. You've raised kids. I bet you love your kids, and they didn't get to do everything they wanted to do just because they wanted to do it. He said, no, there's guidelines, there's rules, there's regulations. So I think sometimes you have to say to people, your logic doesn't make any sense. Bill. I'll address this either to Jeff or Dan. In recent years, we've seen a tremendous increase in what I would call judicial activism, mm -hmm. where we have the will of the people being overturned time after time after time. And traditional marriage is a perfect example. And all these states we mentioned that have overturned these traditional marriage laws. There were laws on the books voted in by a majority of the citizens of those states affirming traditional marriage. How can a judge in some circuit somewhere overturn the will of the people? And if so, what's the purpose of our voting for? If anything we vote for can be overturned by some judge somewhere, and why do we need to vote? What's the purpose of our vote if it's not going to count? It's the nature of what it means to have a right. If marriage is a fundamental right, then you and I don't get to vote on anything relating to it that would infringe that fundamental right. That's what the Constitution means. The basis of the Constitution is to restrict what the government can do and what people can vote on behalf of their so that's the, once you move it, and, and by the way, that's one of the issues, you know, that Dan raised. With the Hobby Lobby case, that was not decided on First Amendment grounds. It was decided on the basis of the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which means Congress could come back next year and do away with it entirely, and force Hobby Lobby to give, to provide the, to provide those contraceptions. It's not, a, it's not a right of constitutional magnitude. Simply a statutory right under RIFRA. Yes. Um, I just have two things. One is regarding homosexuality. You can go to the Divine Mercy Medical Association, and there's lots of science. You don't even need religion to explain to a person why, if you love them, you want what's best for them and their health, and what happens. Um, when you practice homosexuality and what happens to your psyche, there's tons of statistics out there and it's just overall bad for you. And um, my other thing is, I'm, I think this is such an exciting time for clarification and authenticity. And I think that um, we've suffered from lack of authenticity as Catholics for a long, long time, but now we're reaping the horrible benefits of that. Like I gave birth in a Catholic hospital that wanted me on birth control and did abortion and all of that, and Catholic schools all across the nation uh, are, are um, embracing national education, nationalized education. And um, I guess this is such a unique opportunity for us to differentiate ourselves, to actually live our faith, to have our Catholic schools teach Catholicism and use Catholic curriculum, and be different, and offer the public who have faith or don't have faith something different. And I think um, it's the same for our hospitals. And um, I guess I'm wondering why should the government take seriously hospitals who say they're Catholic but offer, you know, why should they get a break on the healthcare stuff if they're already doing that? And why should they take them seriously? Why should they give a break to the Catholic schools when they, they teach the same thing as the public schools? Can you explain to me why? <laughs> Hobby Lobby is the fact that they were able to show. Microphone, microphone, microphone. <laughs> they might not. Uh, what helped Hobby Lobby was the fact that they were able to show a consistent um, business model based on Christ. So just because you're a hospital system owned by the Presentation Sisters, for example, in South Dakota, that may not be enough to get you over the goal line. This is Dan's sister, we want y'all to know. Don't take her, don't take her question. <laughs> Can you give us a good response 
when someone says to you about the issue of gay marriage. Well, that's fine. That's your religious belief, and that's what you believe. But our country has separation of church and state, and our state has said that gay marriage is legal. How do we respond to that as Catholics? Um, I, I think the, the first thing is to say that marriage as a social and political structure throughout history was designed for familial stability, right? It was made to be a permanent bond for the bearing, begetting, and raising of children. Almost every argument that I have read uh, in favor of same-sex marriage is not really an argument at all as to why two men can be married or two women can be married. If you sift it out, it's really an argument as to why marriage means nothing at all. Why marriage is functionally meaningless. Therefore, we should be allowed to, to do it as well. If it's meaningless, then anyone who wants to, or any group of three or four or whatever, should be able to join in. And so I think that the first argument is to say, here's why marriage is important. Even the early Greeks understood it was the, found, it was the foundation upon which societies are built. You don't have to go to Greece, look at Detroit. You can find out what the disintegration of families means to the disintegration of society as a whole. And how historically, for the, for the last 5,000 years, how have we done that? We have done it through the protection of what we have traditionally called marriage. Look, so this may or may not, from 1960 to now, may or may not be the holiest time we've ever lived in. Let's take no position on that. But I think we can definitely agree we've seen the largest disintegration of families and the nature of the impoverishment of children. And not just same sex, but look at what happens economically to women and children following the divorce. And look at how that compares to what happens to men following the divorce. Our problems have to do with fundamental nature of marriage, contraception, bearing and beginning of children. Gay marriage is simply one of the many tentacles that falls off of that, none of which has anything at all. You don't, you don't even have to believe in God. You just have to believe that you want what is best for a stable society to believe that families should be based upon those long-term systems. Also, there's a lot of statistics out, and they showed this um, during the Bishop's Conference. A guy gave a presentation uh, regarding this that Statistically, and this is not nothing that's made up. This guy's a sociologist, so there's a lot of study been done with this. Um, statistically, um, children who are raised in a family with a father and a mother, they do far, 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 far greater than children who, do, who are not raised in that kind of an environment. You know, so I think it speaks clearly to the point that you know, marriage, the tr traditional marriage, a stable marriage is not only for the betterment of children, but it's for the betterment of society. And, um, and I don't know that people who, who, want, who want to talk about you know, the, the freedom regarding um, same-sex marriage, I don't, they cannot refute that, um, because it's, it's very clear in, in statistics. Um, and, and so I don't know how they would line up, you know, the, the, you know they're trying to raise children with you know, two mothers or two fathers or, or whatever it is, um, it's not going to bear out statistically that it's going to be healthy for those kids um, in the long run. Uh, Dan, you talked about uh, the country not being at the point of legally penalizing the church uh, for her beliefs on marriage. Uh, you know, not I, yet. Not yet, yeah, no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, I've had people come up to me and they say, well, why doesn't the Catholic Church in America do what Europe does and get out of the civil marriage business entirely. Uh, and uh, I'd be interested to hear your response to that because it's my understanding that when a Catholic priest marries somebody in the state of South Dakota, they also act as an agent of the state so that it is a civil marriage. In Europe, you know, you get married in the Catholic Church and then you got to walk down to the courthouse. Um, what would be the ramifications? Uh, I mean, would this be something that the church should be looking at? I can tell you, the church actually has, I mean, I know, I mean, the, the church in the, in, in, in the United States has looked at that issue. It's not just South Dakota, and it's not just, obviously, Catholic priests, 
but almost every state has a statute in which ministers of the of the, that church are authorized by statute to give civil validation along with whatever they're doing sacramentally, but civil validation to that marriage. There, I'll tell you, there has been a discussion within the leadership of the church about whether, depending on where this thing goes, whether or not the church is going to have to get out of that business. Because there is a, now there's an entanglement with that, that once that happens, it's, a, it's awful hard to undo what you've done. So I, I don't, until we see where this thing's going to go, and now we start talking about kind of the, the politics of all of this. And that is, and as Jeff just said a few minutes ago, there, there's a lot of these things that are spinning out there that we don't know where they're going to end up. At a constitutional level, we don't really know. Uh, for example, you guys, and all of you read the paper over the course of the last year where there was a, a, a female couple that left South Dakota, went to Minneapolis, and, 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 and came, came back after having, going through a marriage because it's legalized, it had been legalized in Minnesota. So we're going to see more and more of that. So then the question becomes under uh, you know, full faith and credit, under equal protection. I, I mean, there's going to be a number of constitutional issues that are going to come up about the obligations that states will have to begin to recognize what has happened in other states, that we have to give full faith and credit to that. Ultimately, that issue is going to work its way up to the Supreme Court. I think everybody understands that. And the real question hanging fire out there is, is the Supreme Court going to ultimately recognize a fundamental right to marriage for all people, regardless of who your chosen spouse is and what their gender might be? Because once you achieve that status constitutionally, you're, in, you're entitled to what's called a strict scrutiny analysis from that point forward. And that is like Cardinal Goldman said, you know, we've taken a couple thousand years and in about a decade we've done undone all of it. And he, like he said on one of the news programs, we have really, as Jeff said, we've really lost the public relations war uh, on that issue. So long answer to your question, we don't really know whether ultimately the state's going to get out of that. I, you know, anybody who's ever read George Weigel's book, George Weigel was the Pope, now St. Pope John Paul II's official biographer, but he also wrote a book called The Cube in the Cathedral uh, about Europe and about the disintegration of a lot of these issues and values in Europe. So I'm not, I like the European countries, I'm not sure that I would look to them for guidance on a lot of these issues right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily hoping that we go down that kind of path where in many respects you abandon a lot of the the, the historical natural law principles that have guided us to the point we are right now. Um, on, on the same-sex marriage, um, is part of the reason they're filing or trying to get these rights to get marriage privileges on like tax returns, or what's the advantage? Yeah, you know, I, I think it, 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 that's a good question. I think it changes. Jeff can comment on this as well. I think it really does depend, but I think it's a, I think it's a whole scope of issues. There will be certain benefits issues. There will be certain tax issues. There will be a lot of these kinds of issues that will now obviously fall in the lap of whatever kind of relationship you know is, is ultimately going to be going to be recognized. I'll, I'll give you an example. The YMCA in, in this country right now. They're, they're looking at that issue. And this is kind of, you know, what is the impact of all of this? Right now at a national level, the YMCA is now struggling with what constitutes a family membership. And so you just you can kind of take that and let your mind begin to run with it. You you can now all use that and say, oh gosh, I wonder about this or what about that. I wonder. So th you can see that there's a lot of dovetailing of what this is going to mean in a lot of business institutional relationships that we all have with one another and with certain organizations. Dan, I think the quick answer is, is that what they are looking for is to be recognized as the same as traditional marriage. Because in most jurisdictions that have tried to accommodate them with civil unions, that doesn't stop the lawsuits. When the federal courts decided that they could file for federal purposes, this was part of the Windsor decision, the Doma decision, that they could be treated as spouses for federal law purposes, that didn't stop. What they, they say, to be able to be called marriage, if you can do it, I can do it. And that's the basis of the suit. 
Yeah, I got a question about how did our country get into this situation in the first place? Like, why was uh, fortification, adultery uh, overturned in the first place? Sodomy. There are all these were turned over. How did that come to effect? Because that's what the root is, is that somehow we didn't take care of the problem when it was there. And I was just wondering, what was the basis for overturning those laws? They boiled the frog. They all essentially from latent what were considered at the time discussed to be privacy rights. There, there's this famous phrase that Justice Douglas came up with which said that while the Bill of Rights does not discuss privacy, the penumbra of the Bill of Rights, this kind of aura that infuses the document, implies a basic privacy right, the right to be left alone. Once you get there, now we just take out the scalpel and we start slicing what's in it, what's out of it, um, and a lot of it is just the changing in the courts. The Supreme Court in 1986 upheld Georgia's criminal sodomy laws, 1986. Last year, in 2013, the Supreme Court issued a decision that said it is nothing but mean-spirited and hateful to discriminate against homosexual couples. So you're talking less than 30 years. Um, <coughs> and adultery uh, uh, was that same privacy act too. Same issue, but there were also yeah. Yeah. there were also policy implications. In the same way that bastardization laws were done away with and things, they were some of these were seen as stigmatizing innocents and, and children. So they did away with a lot of those. One of the other things with adultery is they found it really wasn't limiting adultery to make it criminal because you couldn't get enough witnesses together, so they decided let's just get rid of it. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like, and I, of course, I, 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 I would say I tried one of these cases in the last two years, alienation of affections. So, yeah, I mean, there's some of these laws that had, 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 had kind of an intended philosophical purpose, but the net result was they didn't really accomplish what the intended goal was, so those, the, the shelf life of those laws wasn't very long. Essentially, society's morals that way. I, I just wanted to make a point that in speaking of um, what we can do locally and personally to try to be involved as people of faith, um, this sexual orientation thing, uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, comes before the school board, the city council, the state legislature all the time, I mean just continuously. The, um, the move is to try to make sexual orientation a protected class. And you heard one of the speakers mention tonight, one of the results of that is that uh, then adoptions couldn't be performed anymore because by, by the Catholic Church in those states or in those cities because that was a protected class. And so there's a real um, direct effect on our society in our communities in our state if we allow those um, same sex, um, the same sex become a, um, a protected class. The protected classes should be those that are immutable, they don't change, like race, and visible, like race, you know, you can't, and same sex, as someone else mentioned here, same sex attraction is just something that a person claims. Well, I may be a heterosexual, and claim to be same sex in order to be considered, if that's a protected class, to get a job, for example. You know, think about that. And so, on the local level, what we can do is turn out when these things come up in force to put um, feet to our faith. Thank you. I'm recognizing the hour. Uh, I said we'd finish at 8.30. Um, we can do, let's do like maybe one or two more questions and then um, an announcement and then we're going to wrap it up. Father Hoy, he's studying law. <laughs> I actually want to make a statement more than I do a question. I just, the issue about homosexuality and, and the like is that we sort of have to admit that we live in a sexually addicted society. And that Whenever you separate the sexual act from children, 
It's selfish. It's selfish. And when you know our teaching in regard to sexual morality really is about true love. Now we believe that homosexual acts are wrong in a large part because we believe that they will never lead them to true happiness. It will never make them happy. And in the fact that we stand for these teachings is a testimony to our love for those who struggle with same-sex attraction. Because we believe that it will never make them happy. And we want the best for them. And because of that, we have to tell them the truth. And the truth is, homosexual acts will never make them happy. That sort of takes us back to the where we began, which I think we'll take with tonight is the, um, the 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 dignity of the human person, how we're created in the image and likeness of God, and how we're created in the image and likeness of God calls us to live out of that dignity. And some of the things we've been discussing tonight, we believe, are counterproductive to and not it doesn't do not allow us to do that which God has called us to do. Um, help us pray. Well, they keep close tabs on me, don't they? <laughs> My whole history, I think. That scares me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we thank you for your presence here tonight, for your deep love for us, and for all of humanity. We lift up our world to you in a very particular way. You know our greatest needs. You know our challenges, our struggles. You know the crisis. You know, you know all that's uh, going on in our world and our society today. We long for holiness, and we ask you to pour out your spirit upon us in a new way, a new evangelization, a new Pentecost. Break through the hearts of those who have not experienced your love, so that they may come to know what true love, what real love is about, and they may live and act out of that in such a way that it brings fulfillment in life and builds a greater world, a better society. It allows our culture to become holy once again. As we go forth from here, give us all courage that we need to be the living presence of your Son, Jesus, in the world today. Regardless of the cost we might have to suffer for that. Give us confidence, courage, all that we need uh, this day and always. And we pray for the, through the intercession of Our Lady that we too may be drawn deeper into the heart of her Son, Jesus, who is our Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.